What is the higher mind? Where does it come from? How can we awake it? Is the higher mind the natural development of the lower mind? Can we reach this higher mind, this higher uh, self, through the development of our lower self? Through, for instance, continued meditation, occult exercises, a mystical experience, or through the continued use of magic practices? Dear friends, tonight we would like to reflect upon in depth of a round of what is this true higher mind? What is its essence, its origin, where it comes from? And what is the process necessary to take place in us so that it can manifest itself in our lives and actually transform our consciousness and our lives? But before we move on, we must get rid of one of the biggest delusions in the path of someone that is actually seeking for this higher mind, for this higher self, as a possibility within himself or herself. And to do that, we would like to use a very famous thought from Helena Blavatsky that is written in one of her most famous books called The Voice of the Silence. This thought says, the mind is the great slayer of the real. Let the disciple slay the slayer. The mind, the lower mind, is the slayer of the real. So our first task is actually to overcome our lower mind, our lower self, so that the path to the true self to the true being, to the higher mind, can open up in front of us. Well, a path, a path between the lower mind and the higher mind. We could compare this path with a bridge, a bridge made of four main pillars and three main connections. This bridge that must be built with our own being is indicated eloquently in the universal teachings of many cultures and many different places. We would like to utilize some of those images to illustrate what we are trying to talk about. Well, we have spoken about a bridge between the lower mind and the higher mind. And this bridge, as we have just mentioned, is made of four distinct states of consciousness, four different states of mind or different states of self. Let's start utilizing the Hindu tra tradition. In the Hindu tradition, we can associate or indicate those four different states of mind or different states of self or self-awareness with the concepts of kama-manas. Kama-manas meaning the mind that is still associated or identified or even controlled by the selfish desires, by the egocentric desires. In second place, we can talk about manas, that is the objective mind that must be born out of a totally different basis, out of a totally different origin. Next to it, we can speak about buddhi. Buddhi meaning the soul consciousness, 
the new liberated soul consciousness that is beyond the mind and that actually uh, uh, inspires the objective mind. And beyond Bodhi, we can talk about Atman or Atman Bodhi that indicates the spirit, the spirit spark or the spirit soul consciousness. So those are, in very simple and summarized terms, those four states of consciousness in the Hindu tra tradition. If we move now to uh, maybe a closer example to some of us, uh, utilizing the Egyptian tradition, and we take the example of that fantastic temple of Abu Simbel in the very southern part of Egypt. Uh, in the innermost wall of this temple, we can see four monumental statues uh, of these four states of consciousness, one sitting by another. And we can see, in first place, in this very order, by the way, Ptah, that is the god of the underworld or the god of darkness. Next to Ptah, we can see a man, an enlightened man, uh, represented by a pharaoh king, Ramses. Next to Ramses, we can see Ramses himself in his immortal shape, in his Osiris shape. So we see the third character, Osiris. And in the fourth place, we can see the hawk god that represents the spirit itself, Horus. If we come even closer uh, to our Western traditions now, and we utilize the gospel or the Christian tradition, we can see those four states of consciousness represented by the very famous, famous gospel characters of Herod, the powerful king in Jerusalem at the time when uh, Jesus was born, with obviously all the associated state of consciousness and reactions of this character, as we certainly must know. Then we have John the Baptist. Then we have Jesus, or Jesus the Lord, as it is mentioned in the Gospel. And after the sacrifice and the transformation of Jesus, we see the appearance of Christ. In, in the modern uh, rosy cross, in the symbol of the modern rosy cross, we could see those four different states of consciousness represented by or associated with the four different main aspects of the symbol of the school. We can see the point. We can see the triangle. We can see the square. And finally, the circle. Well, this, let's say, is the, four, the first aspect of this bridge. But in this bridge, we only have the pillars. We only have, let's say, the, the comparison or the contrast of very different states of consciousness coming from the lower mind to the higher mind from the lower self to the higher self. And as we said before, the universal teaching or the message of the spiritual schools of all times, they teach us 
that it is not through the development of the lower ego, the self-identified ego, and the egocentric patterns that we carry, that we are going to achieve this new, superior, liberated state of life. So, this is very important for us to understand that there is a stark difference between this initial state of life, that is our state of life, as egocentric human beings, and the fully liberated new state of life. And it would be a major delusion to try to utilize the slayer of the real to achieve the real. So what do we need to understand? We need to understand, we need to recognize, we, we must accept that it's not through the training of the lower mind or through an attempt to, to transform the pure darkness of our being or the egocentric consciousness into a liberated spiritual being. We must go through a totally different process. It is not through training. It is not through exercises. It is not through forcing ourselves into it. Actually, it is compared to a turnaround. It is a self-revolution. It is an inner revolution. A revolution that is threefold because it is made of three consecutive processes, inner processes, that must take place in us and we must become this bridge. Our being must be transformed into the raw materials of the connections that must take place between these four pillars. So that's why the universal teaching also speaks about these three fundamental processes. And we can see these three fundamental processes connecting these four different states of consciousness. In the ancient traditions of the past, uh, for instance, in Egypt, but even in India or in China, we hear about the metamorphosis of the caterpillar, the cocoon, and the butterfly. We also hear about, in the Christian tradition, uh, in the, the writings of Paul, for example, of these three processes indicated as faith, hope, and love. In the classic alchemy, we recognize those classic three processes by the names of Nigredo, Albedo, and Rubedo. In other words, these three processes throughout the history of mankind are always the same, with different names, with different symbols, but they indicate a threefold self-revolution because it is only through a true self-revolution that this transformation from the lower self or the lower mind into the upper self or the upper mind can take place. And in the modern Rosy Cross, we can recognize those three processes described as the elements that connect the different aspects of this symbol that point to this inner transformation, to this inner revolution and indicate the way that it can take place. 
The first process is a process of transformation of the consciousness. Is a process that stimulates the consciousness, the human consciousness or the human soul to abandon the automatic uh, 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 questions or the automatic uh, reactions uh, for uh, the day-to-day -day life. So this process is called the rebirth of the soul. The rebirth of the soul starts from the spirit spark. It doesn't start from any structure of the ego. It starts directly from the innermost center of the human microcosm. In the spiritual school we call this spirit spark the spirit spark atom, the rosebud, the rose of the heart. This is the source. This is the origin of this true potential new self, this true potential new mind or upper mind or higher mind. The rebirth of the soul can actually connect and transform the human consciousness that is enclosed in its egocentric stru structure into a quote-unquote, symbolically speaking, a rose that starts to, to blossom, to open up, and transforms the three centers of our consciousness, of our soul. That is, our heart, our head, and our hands, or our lives. And this is what recreates in us the triangle of a new soul, of a soul that was reborn. Reborn not through the techniques or manipulation of its own ego, but out of the spirit spark in the innermost of his or her own being. The second process the spiritual school describes as the unification, the unity that is produced between this reborn consciousness and the universal power that we call spirit. This power that when enters again into the organic structure of the human consciousness unfolds, subdivides itself into the seven centers of the, the human consciousness or, for example, the seven energetic centers of our astral body, our chakras, for example. And that's why we call this the sevenfold spirit, the power of the universe, the universal original power that when gets in contact with a transformed human consciousness, unfolds and gradually transforms the overall structure of this consciousness and unifies again the human aspect of the consciousness with the original source of the universe, the inspiration force of the universe that we call spirit. So. We are going to indicate this as the unification with the spirit. And this second process is what allows a transformation of our vehicles, of our mental body, of our astral body, of our etheric body, and as a consequence, the fundamental transformation of our physical body, not externally, of course, but especially uh, as a vehicle of the manifestation of this overall modification 
in our subtle bodies. So here comes the square. And when through the spirit spark, through the rose of the heart, the human consciousness, the human soul is fundamentally transformed and unified again with the spirit, then the vehicles of the personality can be transformed into this third process, the transmutation, the true alchemy of our whole being that we also call in the modern spiritual school as the process of transfiguration, the modification, the transformation of the entire self, of the entire being. This process leads to the total unity of the four states of consciousness into one. Of the original center that once became awakened, that transformed the entire soul life of the human being, of the heart, of the head and the hands, that transmuted and transfigured all the, the bodies, all the vehicles of the mental aspect, the astral aspect, the etheric aspect and the physical aspect and unified again the being with the original source of life with the eternal divine microcosm, the human microcosm. That is how, dear friends, the lower mind is dissolved, not as a loss of identity, but through the entire alchemy of its elements in a gradual process that transforms the consciousness and the manifestation into the higher mind, into the higher self, into the true human being. Uh, we hope uh, that this very uh, summarized explanation uh, could have brought to you tonight uh, some elements for your reflection, for your inner work. And now we would like to open up uh, for the second part of this meeting uh, for your questions, uh, for your comments, uh, and for any other aspect of the teaching of the Golden Rosy Cross that you would like to, to discuss. Please feel free. So it seems that uh, so far we only have one question. And this uh, one question is, what is manas? Uh, manas is a word that indicates the original sense of man, of human being. Manas means the thinker, means the one that is able to receive in his or her true objective mind, the ideation force of the universe that we call the spirit, to create a link between spirit and matter. And through this superior understanding, the true understanding of the human mind, to manifest the divine original plan of life in uh, in the real life, uh, in, in the day-to-day -day life. Uh, that is why manas is also the connection point between spirit and matter. Uh, and uh, if we took the liberty here of 
illustrating a little bit more. Here you have all the dots from the other page. <laughs> so, if you assume that you have an upper triad and a lower triad, and here you have the physical body and the etheric body and the astral body, and here you have the spirit, here you have the soul spirit, in this space, let's say the point of encounter, you have manas. You have, let's say, in essence, right? The higher mind and the lower mind. Using here uh, you, the acronyms that we find in the Hindu tradition, the ones that we have used in the first place. What does that mean? This is really important, and uh, maybe we should take a couple of minutes to explore it. In our current state of development, uh, that is really not the final goal of human manifestation. We are literally stuck. We are stuck in the middle. Uh, we have gone through this evolution process up to the point where we became self-aware. And in the moment that we became self-aware, our mind, our lower mind, became totally identified with our organic, stru organic structure, with our astral life, with our emotions, with our impulses, with you know, uh, the, the subconscious life, the unconscious life. And that's why Kamamanas, the lower mind, is number one, disconnected from the higher mind, and at the same time, totally identified and controlled by this overpowering forces of the astral body, of the etheric streams, and even the physical reality. And we live as if we were living on a daydream. You know, daydreaming, totally identified that this external reality uh, is what drives our inner lives and actually is the other way around. So, what needs to take place is that from the center, from the rose of the heart, a new superior mind principle must appear as the other half of the mind, as the piece that is actually missing, so that when this new upper mind appears or manifests itself, then one whole objective mind can work in the system again not from bottom up, but from the top to the bottom. It means from the highest ideation power of the universe that we call the spirit, through the radiation field that this ideation force creates in our microcosm, connecting with an objective mind, that can once again put in order, can once again organize the life of the four manifested vehicles. So obviously there's a lot to speak about manas, but these are some elements that may eventually help you in your reflection. There is one second question uh, about how can we support the rebirth process? That's a, that's a very important question. Well, the rebirth process. The rebirth process is the manifestation 
of a totally new set of possibilities in ourselves. And the question is important because it goes to the heart of the problem. If we are made of automatic reactions, if we are almost nothing but a set of uh, automatisms, and our egocentric being is literally living through loops of repetition, how can we actually help in the process of liberating ourselves from the reactions that we are totally identified with in the first place? Well, let's uh, utilize this symbol again. We said that our soul, our consciousness, is made of three main centers that we symbolically represent uh, with the heart, the head, and the hands, or with our emotional life, with our mental life, and our actions or reactions. In essence, we must use this point as a lever. We must use this voice that calls as a, a yearning call uh, in the very heart of our consciousness as the point, the basis point, so that we can start moving uh, the other aspects of our consciousness. It means to create a space of silence, not a forced silence, not a silence through exercises or through occult practices or nothing of that sort, but actually a self-awareness, a self-observation and a self-knowledge space that can actually start opening up inner space in ourselves and creating this space, creating this area of self-observation where we can start realizing through self-knowledge, through self-observation, that we are not our thoughts. We are not our feelings. We are not our reactions. Everything that we call thoughts, feelings, reactions, just for an example, and that we so often call, this, this is me, I mean, uh, you know, I, I think this, or I feel that, or I, I react this way, etc. These are just automatic reactions of our own ego. It is our ego in repetition, in cycle. And in the moment that we make an effort to merely observe, based on this impulse, that we have received from the very heart of our microcosm, then we can start realizing how attached, how imprisoned we are. And by realizing that, then we can actually start changing our lives and changing our attitudes. Apparently, we don't have more questions. We will wait a couple of seconds to see if any of our friends that are participating would like to pose any questions. You can also uh, leave uh, your comments uh, with further questions that we can uh, later address. Okay, well, apparently we don't have uh, any more questions. Uh, so I believe that we can uh, conclude uh, the meeting of, of tonight. Uh, we would like to, uh, uh, you know, to say a big thanks for your participation and also invite you uh, for uh, the next session that will probably take place 
in approximately one month. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we'll continue to have our face-to-face -face public conferences, uh, both uh, in uh, the area of uh, Manhattan in New York City. We are also active uh, in London and uh, some other uh, cities uh, in, in English-speaking countries. And we would like to encourage you uh, to look for information in our Facebook pages uh, of the Golden Rosy Cross. Thank you very much for your participation and a very good evening to all.